The Bloody Podcastacre with Zach Walters and Kennedy Catherine. I'll just oh we're recording oh hi hi <laughs> <laughs> welcome back to the bloody podcast occur that's zach walters and that's kennedy catherine we're settled back in for second recording with a nice gin smash love it my least favorite but lemon mint um this one isn't as minty as i remember it being which is nice um maybe now because it's also warm weather i'm like ugh, i would love to just be anywhere drinking a cold drink <laughs> yes same and that's that on that thank you horror news we just watched two trailers yeah but we just watched uh specifically we just watched the m night Shyamalan trailer for the movie old and we were both goosebumped gooped hooped gagged in we were sold that looks good it looks very good i'm just worried that the ending is going to be underwhelming it has such a great setup, such a good premise. I'm not going to even concern myself with that right now. It's none of my business. You're right. We still have months away. And I was, you know, I was in, but I was one foot in the door. And then all of a sudden, there he was. Our good old wolf brother, Alex. Alex. From Hereditary. What's his brother's name? I do not know. Oh, that's so strange. They are very identical. Can I see? Yeah. Oh my God. Very yeah. identical. They used to have a show, Naked Brothers Band. I did not realize that that was what he was from. I've, yeah. I've never seen it. but That's like, both of them. I'm pretty sure Nat Wolf has been in scary movies, and I just cannot, I can't place. We also watched the trailer for Escape Room 2. We did. Which you haven't seen the first. No, but I would like to do a double feature when this one comes out. Because mm-hmm. it looks like, like I was saying, I don't know anything about them, but it looks like high production value. It's definitely one of those movies where it's not... Knocks out of the park fantastic, but it's entertaining. Yeah, sort of Final Destination-y. Yeah, it's very much... Like, when I finished the first one in the theaters, I was like, this is going to set up to be a Final Destination, a Saw, a movie franchise, rather than just, like, a standalone one. Mm -hmm. And it's so popular, like, escape rooms in general. Man, I'll know that COVID is over when I put myself in an escape room with some other people. Oh, I miss those. Me too, they're so fun. Um, All the ones at Escape City, my favorite. Incredible. I've done them all. Me too. So my friend Jen and I went into that magician one. There are certain things in the escape room where you needed more than two people. Yeah. So when we would be approaching something that needed a third person, like those mirrors where you had to hold them. Yes. We needed a third person. So the worker would come in and just like kind of just hold the one mirror. We would have to tell him where to like go because he wouldn't give it away. Right. So we would just like, he would come in and whatever and just like help us and then he would leave. We went, like, in fall, maybe. It was a little chilly, so we each had coats on, but we kept them on because, for some reason, we didn't want to put them in those lockers. Halfway through, we're like, okay, we're just going to take off our jackets, put them in the corner, we'll come get them <laughs> later. So the guy knocks on the door to come help us, and he opens the door, and he goes, are you decent? We both were like, yes, because... <laughs> I thought you guys got naked! <laughs> like, he thought that... You're watching us on cameras in the corner. Like, you know that we're wearing clothes. Oh, yeah, sorry. We're just lounging. <laughs> both of us. Yeah. And we both were like, yeah, can you come grab this mirror, sir? <laughs> you know that guy has seen some shit. Um, just I'm going to quickly rattle off some things. Mm-hmm. They're doing a Hellraiser reboot. I've never seen any of them. I have. Um, it's one of my good friend's comfort horror movies. I was going to say, they're quirky. They're fun. Um, So that's interesting. Yep. They are starting a reboot of Firestarter. They're starting production on it, like Blumhouse and Jason Blum. Firestarter? I don't know that one. That's but... the first movie that, um, what's her name? Drew Barrymore was in. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, Zac Efron's supposed to be in it, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, they're making an Evil Dead sequel to the original series. I feel like we just gotta stop with that shit. I know. Well, especially because they did a whole TV series on it. Yeah. And then, kind of leading into what we're going to talk about today, Spiral, which is the new... Saw installment? Yes. Is going to be on Stars for Halloween. Oh, good. Which is nice. But it put the Saw series into the $1 million... Sorry, the $1 billion movie club for top box office. Great, but also, is that really an accomplishment when there's, like, fucking ten? Yeah, no, it's not. 
it's doing very well at the box office. But also when you think about it, where we are right now, there's, there's like two movies in the theaters that are new. Yeah, like nothing's coming out right now. No. So it joins Saw, the series, joins the Billion Dollar Club with the Alien series, mm. the Resident Evil series, and also the Conjuring series. Good for the Conjuring. But also like when you think about it, they also have like nine films. But does the con- so when they say the Conjuring, are they factoring in Annabelle? They are. I think so, and the Nun. Yeah. They're saying it as a franchise. Cool. So I would assume that that means all of the above. Yes, but let's start. Okay. We're going to talk about Saw. The one, the only. The, the one, not, not the only. Not, no. <laughs> Saw, directed by James Wan. I did not know this was James Wan. I didn't either, and this is his direct- directorial, directorial debut. debut. But let me just say, mm. first ideal day, getting put into a jigsaw trap together like it's an escape room but make it fun and romantic but then if it doesn't go well you're personally no you're permanently have trauma bond together true and if not you just die right so there's it's like you want like a high state you want to actually live this experience on a first date yeah it's either you're stuck with them or you die or you die that's what we're all looking for it's like a win-win situation either way and now you're bonded for life i think you found the key to dating i'm not gonna say what i do is is good work but it's work I'm willing to do for all of you. Yes. So you're welcome. Do you want me to be Jigsaw in this scenario? No, I want you to be the puppet <laughs> <laughs> on the tricycle. Can you imagine me on a... Let's do it for Halloween. <laughs> You'll be on the track. I think that we have said, if you went back, I would love if someone could go back and and, Pick out... and record every time Zach and I have said that we're going to be Something someone for, for Halloween. Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> it's happened at least four times. Yeah. Anyways, 2004. Where were you? Um, elementary school. I was, oh, I had an insane crush on my teacher and she got married and she didn't tell us and she just came back and she changed her last name and I was a wreck. That? I couldn't imagine what that felt like. Oh my God. I was devastated. You were like, I can never see this woman ever again in my life. And not only was she my teacher, but she was really good friends with my best friend's mom who lived on the street. Of course. So she's going to be around. Yeah. Oh my God. Devoed. I'm so sorry. For you. Thank you. Thank you. I think like that's when I looked at all my friends and their reaction and realized, oh, oh, something's, oh. <laughs> something's oh. amiss. <laughs> Something ain't right. Hmm. The wind seems different today. Um, this is the curious reaction I'm having. Well, I'm glad though that you're here and you're still sane. A well, real to, coming of age tale. To some degree. Yeah. Um, saw. Much like my heartbreak. Devastating. <laughs> Great low-budget horror film. Low-budget horror film. <laughs> it was, yeah. So I was re-watching the second one before you came today. Yes, you were. And I think I've only seen two through X, Y, Z, I don't know how many there are, once. So I don't really remember how the story goes other than, like, pretty monumental parts of the film. They kind of lose the plot at some point anyways. Yeah, I, I always say one, two, and three are Bangers. solid movies. Yeah. Four on, I'm pretty sure seven, eight. I think eight was like the final chapter, and then they did Jigsaw now Spiral. Yeah. Around five and six, you were like, What's happening? You're like, Okay, this is still fun. It's so original in so many senses still. But also at the same time, you're like, What are, who are these characters? What, how are these people still alive? Well, Some and of at them. At that point, it was just fun. It wasn't realistic yeah. or like thought provoking. No. It was just fun. And I don't even remember how the whole series wrapped up. Me neither. I'm going to watch them all again. Yeah. Like, I'm probably going to do that this week of just, like, powering through them all. I went through a period of time where the Saw series was my comfort horror movies. Um, there was multiple times, and by multiple I mean one, me and my friend Dre went to a bar downtown. When we came back, it was like two in the morning, and we both were just, like, out. But also still, like, wanting to watch TV, you know, like that mood, yeah, or just yeah, put yeah, something yeah. on. We put on Saw Deaths Ranked, or all, and we watched it for a solid hour. <laughs> two in the morning. I've, I've seen the first one quite a few times. I have two, but, and I've, I know I've told this story, Saw was the first movie that I ever had a burnt copy of. I watched it a couple of times, but I never went back to the original as an adult. And so I think I watched, I really got to figure out which one it is, because it'll haunt me, because I've mentioned it so many times, and then I never know which one it is. I think it's six, where Jill, his ex-wife, comes in. And yeah. Yes. Five or six. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, like um, John Kramer's ex-wife. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I like that actress. Anyways, um, mm-hmm. that that specific one 
was like my comfort horror movie for a long time. Interesting. That's so close to the end. Yeah, but it's weird because it's they don't lose the plot in that one. I feel like they almost return to it for a second to be like, here's a backstory of why he's such like a angry man. True. See, and I don't remember which... It's hard because I don't want to spoil anything before we get into it. Yeah. Okay, do you want me to just read the synopsis? One thing that I love about this movie is the ending. And so I really want people, if they haven't seen it and don't know any spoilers, to go watch this before you listen to the plot. Mm-hmm. Um, for me personally, I love watching people's Reaction. reactions to it. So like, I think that's why I've seen the first one so many times. Before you listen to the plot, go watch, go watch it. And here it is. So, Adam, a photographer, awakens in a grungy bathtub. His ankle is chained to a pipe. Across the room is Dr. Gordon, and the corpse of an apparent suicide victim is between them. He holds a revolver and a cassette recorder. Both men find a tape in their pockets. Adam's tape urges him to escape, while Gordon's tape tells him to kill Adam by 6 o'clock, or his wife and daughter will be killed. Adam finds two hacksaws inside the toilet, which they try to use to cut through their chains, but Adam's breaks. Gordon realizes that the saws are meant to be used on their feet and identifies their captor as Jigsaw, a serial killer testing his victim's will of survival through murderous contraptions as games. Five months earlier, Gordon was interrogated by detectives who found his pen light at the scene of one of Jigsaw's games. After giving a sound alibi, he was released, and detectives found Jigsaw's warehouse. There, they apprehended him and saved a man from a trap, but Jigsaw escaped after a trap in the hallway killed one of the detectives. In the present, Dr. Gordon's wife and daughter are being held captive in their home. The house is simultaneously being watched by one of the detectives who'd been discharged from duty but become obsessed with the Jigsaw case, convinced that Gordon was the killer. Meanwhile, Gordon finds a box containing a one-way cell phone, recounting his abduction in a parking garage by a masked figure who also captured Adam. Held at gunpoint, Dr. Gordon's wife calls and warns him not to trust Adam, who admits that he was paid by the fire detective to spy on him and reveals his knowledge of Gordon's affair with one of his medical students. Once the clock strikes six and Gordon has still not managed to kill Adam, the captor moves to murder his wife and daughter, but a fight ensues. The struggle attracts the detective's attention and he saves them before chasing the captor named Zepp, who shoots him. Gordon, only aware of the gunshots and screaming he's heard over the phone, saws off his foot in desperation and shoots Adam with the corpse's revolver. Zepp enters the bathroom, but Adam, having survived the gunshot, bludgeons him to death with the toilet tank lid. Gordon crawls out of the bathroom to find help while Adam searches Zepp's body for a key and finds another tape, revealing that Zepp was just another victim following the rules of the game. As the tape ends, the corpse in the middle of the room rises and is revealed to be Kramer, the real Jigsaw killer, who reveals to Adam that the key to his ankle chain was in the bathtub and went down the drain when he'd first woken up. Horrified, Adam attempts to shoot him, but Kramer shocks him through his chain and exits the bathroom. Kramer shuts off the lights and seals the door, leaving a screaming and helpless Adam to die. Saw. I saw it. I seen it. We've been seen. We've been done seen it. What a movie. What a tale. Rewatching it now, I keep in mind kind of things that we've discussed over the past, I was going to say few episodes, <laughs> the past 20 some episodes we've done. Yes. Is, is this going to be rewatchable? Rewatchability, I feel like, is such a contributing factor to mm-hmm. whether or not you love a film. That first impression sticks. Mm-hmm. And then I feel like you kind of trick yourself into thinking you're going to relive that and you just can't. It never happens. No. So there's rewatchability, but then there's also, what is the second one I'm looking for? If it's going to hold up. Right. And so I was thinking about both of those things Mm -hmm. going into watching Saw. And also now I start thinking more critically instead of just watching as a viewer. So watching this, I was like kind of nervous. I was like, this might not be good. It is. (sighs) Here's the thing. It keeps the story going. Yeah. Acting is subpar. The quality is just not that great. And that's True. fine. But the sound design to me was so weird. Like the second I started it, I was like, hmm. Yeah, something is off. Yeah, something is off. And I asked you before we started recording if when you were watching it, if your just regular speech in the movie was so much quieter than everything else. Yes. And I was like, what? I don't understand what was happening. I feel like horror movies do that. The dialogue is so quiet. It's like trying to reel you in to like pay attention to what they're saying. And then they like 
cut to something just loud. Throw a scream at you and suddenly and it's like, like 17 God. decibels higher. Yeah, the sound design was weird. Mm-hmm. But I do think that it's very original. For sure. it really started that whole torture porn, quote unquote, yeah, I mean, I genre. Feel like, I feel like torture porn had been around for a long time, but the concept of this serial killer mm-hmm. was very new. And the moral game of it all is a thing that you see a lot in, like, hide-and-seek or even aspects of, like, an escape room type of thing Mm -hmm. where these characters could, like, potentially be pitted against each other. Saw kind of laid a foundation for that. Mm -hmm. And then I do think that they took it way too far. We're on movie nine that just came out. But yeah, I don't know. I, I do stand by that I think that this is a good movie and that it holds up. I think it's rewatch. Like I said, I think it's a good movie. I think if you've never seen it before, watch it. The rewatchability factor is low Mm -hmm. i think the whole aesthetic of the movie also is what draws me in Mm -hmm. because it's such like a grungy dark i mean besides the fact that it's like actually dark visibly dark yes we never love that no it makes everything so hard to fucking watch i know and you're just like can we just like up the exposure like two two notches i always end up having to adjust your tv yes have you done the new color balancing on your tv no oh it's so fun Okay. You take your phone. Do you have Face ID? No. no. Um. You take your phone and you put it up to your TV and it like scans your room through your camera and like flashes like the lights and then it adjusts your TV. Girl, I got an iPhone 7. I, I don't know about that. Anyways, it's, it's fun. Well, tell me what you were saying about the lighting of it. Got it. Yeah. So they originally screened this movie at Sundance. Mm. I don't know how ratings work if movies get ratings after screening them once or before because they they made the rating change well they definitely would have a test group yes so maybe that's what it was at sundance it was originally rated nc-17 not because it was bloody and gory and disgusting but because of the sound design and also the lighting i just don't understand that so the fluorescent lights were apparently something that was a factor in this and that there was too much Mm mm-hmm Maybe we shouldn't watch somebody gutting someone on the floor to get a key. If it's under fluorescence. Yes. But if it's under just some dark dim light, sure. Fine. Maybe because it was too bright. I think there it are, was revealing. There are lots of very strange rules in filmmaking like that. I know. Well, and I did see that they did cut the scene of Amanda. She's a character who survives a previous jigsaw puzzle and... Um, she is digging around in somebody's abdomen trying to find a key to unlock the trap that is on her head. And in the original one, it was, like, longer mm-hmm. of her digging, which, why? For I think, what? I know. I think that what they showed was perfectly fine. And then there's also a scene where it's kind of our first introduction to somebody outside of the two people in the room. And he is crawling through barbed wire to get out. Mm-hmm. And so the gas doesn't trap him or he doesn't bleed to death. And apparently that scene was longer. That was pretty brutal. But I did like how the stylistic choice of how they changed it was that they would just speed up the film and make it look like time was passing so fast because it really is a race against the clock for all of these characters. Right. Other than Adam and Dr. Gordon, who have 17 fucking hours in a room together. So annoying. Um, I would have never made it 17 hours. No, I think it was seven, but six? <sighs> Whatever it was, I wouldn't have done Still, it. it's a full day's work and I don't want to do it. <laughs> Not all of the characters die in this movie, even though you're made to believe that they do. But I think that they do carry over well into the other movies. Because mm-hmm. Amanda is in the second one. Yeah. And she is the star of the second Amanda's one. Amanda's also in the sixth. I think she's also in the third. Nope, there's somebody else in the third. That might be from two. Those movies are just one movie to me. Our girl Shawnee Smith is her name. Oh, she, uh, my favorite actress. Yeah, Shawnee Smith. She was on a show called Becker that I really loved. Oh, of course. With um, Sir Ted Danson. Who you're just saying words? <laughs> None of these people or shows are real. Mary, do you know who Mary Steenburgen is? No. The mother from Step Brothers. No. Yes, I've, you do. I've never seen Step Brothers. Okay, you know who Mary Steenburgen is without a doubt, and I have to show you just to. Um... Are we? I can't even say the quote. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Okay, hold on. But that's Step Brothers, is it not? Yes, it is. Oh, what else is she in? Everything. Everything. And She's then, the mom in everything, you're right. Yes, and then her husband is Ted Danson. He was in The Good Place. Never seen that either. Okay, well, you know who Ted Danson is for sure. Ted Danson. Tony Danza? Ted Danson, not Hold Me Closer, Tony oh, Danza. Yeah. Um, 
He was on a show called Becker for a number of years. It was a sitcom where he was he was like a curmudgeon doctor, and Shawnee Smith from Saw played his receptionist. A tale for (laughs) everyone to enjoy. Fun facts to tell at Thanksgiving. Mary Steenburgen. Steenburgen is one whole word. She is the mom and elf. Yes, she is. That's where I know her from. I'm just looking at her list of letterboxed films. One of my many sexual awakenings, Mary Steenburgen. I thought you were going to say elf. No. (laughs) Yeah, she's also in Back to the Future uh, 3. Haven't seen that. She was in The Help, but I don't remember who she was. Was she in The Help? Elaine Stein was her character. Oh, she was also in Did You Hear About the Morgans? Do you remember that movie? I sure fucking did. She was um, she was like the safe house that mm-hmm. Sarah Jessica Parker ended up at. Interesting. I'm glad that we just went through this all. All of this for people who are quite literally not in this movie at all. Anyways, Shawnee Smith. Yes, yeah, she's in the... Sixth. Yeah. I and mean, then she became his apprentice, right? Dr. Gordon becomes his apprentice in the last one. Fucking hell. That's where he comes back. Combed. If you can't beat him, join, join him. him. <laughs> for real. I would, I would kill myself first. <laughs> If, but then also at the same time, I'd be like, I can't have the fact of maybe going back into the game. Like, this is some Hunger Games shit. Do you think he was like, be my apprentice or you're back in the game? I don't know. But I all, of a, sudden, a all of a sudden, it became Survivor All-Stars. Gordon. Amanda. <laughs> Adam, maybe. They'll resuscitate him. Yeah. Gordon's wife, Monica Potter. Everybody. Zep. They're yeah. back. Here we go, baby. And you know what? I wouldn't put it past them because... They've made everything else. <laughs> they've done it. So why not resuscitate somebody? I don't even know where to go from here. Fun facts. Do you have any... What about this movie? Do you so like... So we have... Nothing. Oh, no, I like... Listen. Listen. I think the reason that I really love this movie is because of the ending. Yeah, it's very smart. Like I said, there's this suicide victim man... In a pool of blood. In a pool of blood in the middle of this floor in this bathroom that they've been in for several hours. I, too, like to lay down and pretend I'm dead. And then he just gets up. My, fi- my favorite thing to envision is him in a bathroom by himself putting a prosthetic on his own head to lay down on this I'm sure he did it before. For seven hours? Well, here's the thing. Why did I say that like Holly Hunter? (laughs) Here's the thing that I don't understand. John Kramer allegedly has cancer. What was it that he was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to lay down in a pool of blood. Mm. I'm going to drug myself and be out for seven hours. He drugs himself so that he's not breathing. Oh, very smart. How I did mean, he survive? Like, he's breathing, but it's, like, very shallow breath so that you don't see. Because if you were in that room, you would notice that someone was breathing. If they were right. laying on their stomach, their lower back would lower and raise on the ground. And you'd be like, right. something's not right here. Dr. Kramer, um, Excuse sir. Me. And if I was in this game, like, willingly as a willing participant like him, I'd want to be fucking knocked out, too. I don't yeah, know but also, like, what? I mean, here's the thing. So clever, laying in the middle of that room. Truly. I'm pretty sure having cancer and then doing all that dirty things on the ground, being in that blood, having all those drugs in your system isn't helping your cause. I mean, Mr. you already Johnny got Boy. Cancer, so you might as well. You know what? You're right. Tell me. You were saying something. I, well, I was just saying that the reason that I love was that? this movie so much is because of that ending. It's just what like solidifies <laughs> it for me. It was something that was literally right in front of everybody's eyes for the whole hour and a half. It's like, and there's no clues leading up to it being like, that you could have missed it. Because watching it this time, I was kind of like, okay, is there anything that's leading to be like, it's clear that that is the person in, who's laying there. Right. There's no indication. It just like totally comes out of left field. Wow. So to Adam, he takes off his little prosthetic so that he can just have his plain old bald head back. <laughs> I don't know why he had to do that right then. Well, you know what? Because it maybe it was like... Dramatic effect also. It's not like he he's having a moment. Yeah, he's also coming to out of like a coma, a light coma. Right. But he has, like, a nice little interaction with Adam before he electrocutes him, where he's, like, the keys are in the bathtub so that he can let himself go. But then also he tries to, Adam tries to shoot John Kramer. Not a smart idea. Adam kind of had it coming because he was, like... Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, he did, because at one point he's, like, give me that sweet little cancer, and there's a cancer patient in the room with him. Yes, that's, that's true. Uh, there's very few things that I think people should have to die for, but you're right. I don't know. But also, Adam really thought that he had it. He thought he was good to go. He did. Dr. Kramer. Nope. Dr. Gordon. Dr. Gordon left, and he's like, you know what? At least I have the corpse. And the corpse said, I'm out. <laughs> but the corpse also was like, hey, you were afraid to be alone. You're not alone now. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm actually here living, breathing. The um, end of the, the, it's just the end of this movie that really... But also... <laughs> go off, sis. 
All of the traps are so wonderfully thought through. It's true. The whole concept of, like, having someone's jaw explode. Her jaw just wouldn't explode. Like when You're they right. Sh- like, her whole fucking head. It would just be a neck. It was a bear trap. It was a bear trap in her mouth. Yes. That, like, makes me... Ugh. All I could taste was metal in my mouth. Oh my god, I'm getting like goosebumps when you actually have like a piece of tin foil that was on like a piece of food and yes. you chew it. That times like four metal prongs in your mouth. Or but when you go to the dentist and they like tap your tooth with like so the metal gross. thing. You didn't say that to me. But now think of it like just prongs in your mouth and it's like this dirty, rusting metal. Some part of me feels like you would be so, so much adrenaline, so mm-hmm. confused. That you might not care about that that much. And that death, though brutal, would be instantaneous. That's going to yeah. take your entire fucking head off. Bear traps and the potential of stepping in one where you're going to survive. Yeah. Awful. I don't want that ever. If I had to choose. No, I don't desire it. So we had we had differing um, sources on what, what the inspiration of this movie was. Yeah. So I'm going to start. James Wan explained that he read a story when he was about 17, which is a story that I also know that ruined me. And it was about a man who broke into people's homes and tickled the feet of their children. Why do we all know this? Because it's true. It's a thing that happened. But I didn't know about children. Yes. I know about the one man who was breaking in and tickling men's feet. Well, I think the Night Stalker did that as well. Is that the Netflix documentary? I mean, it is a Netflix documentary, but it is also a true thing that happened. It's a real event. But those two don't coincide? What? The Night Stalker that's on Netflix isn't about the man who tickles feet. No. Okay. That's no. all I wanted to no, clarify. No. Um, so he, yeah, tickling feet. And James said, <laughs> it was the creepiest thing I've ever heard. I was so frightened. I remember hearing that story. I slept for the next three nights with a hammer by my bed. Extreme. Wow. But then when the man was arrested... Things took a weird turn because he claimed that someone else made him do it. So the cops interrogated him and he said he didn't do it on his own. He did it because he was forced to, which became the foundation of the whole idea of like the moral game that the victims Mm -hmm. are forced to play. And for the introduction of Jigsaw, that also came from that story because when he was arrested, the man said that he was sent a Jigsaw piece in the mail and that's how he was instructed to break into the rooms of children to tickle them. Such an upsetting concept. Tickling is the fucking worst. I anybody who thinks tickling is fun. It's such a weird torture and like such a weird thing to inflict on a child. I know. And it's like fucked. How does it work? Moving your fingers and just like an up and down motion on somebody's body that makes them laugh, but also like squeamish? Squirm. But I get that. Like certain areas of my body are so unenjoyable for me to have people touch like my lower back. I hate it. Yeah, no, I understand. Also, I hate when people poke your sides just generally don't be annoying yeah don't be annoying towards my person and my autonomy and i won't be annoying towards yours let me have my space don't touch me annoyingly thank you Good this night. has been a psa <laughs> from the boy podcast don't touch our bodies ever what was your inspiration that you found so mine wasn't from james wan but it was more from the like screenwriter of the film okay lee winnell lee winnell hmm Winnell. But there was a time in his life where he had serious migraines. He eventually had an MRI done and pondered the thought of, if I have a brain tumor, what would he do if he was going to die soon? Mm -hmm. And how he was going to react to that? And so he was kind of thinking, like, if I have 10 minutes left to live, how is he going to spend 10 minutes and be a better human? And if he was going to get out of that. The synopsis that I gave doesn't give a backstory for why John did what he did. So do you want to just kind of explain that? John Kramer, who is the, like... Antagonist. Yeah, and, like, the lead in this film... No, he's not. He's not the lead. He's not, but he's the um, villain. Yeah, he's the villain in this whole series. Um, is a man who is dying of cancer and realizes that he's fucked up. And he's realizing that a bunch of other people are fucked up. And wants to give them a second chance to better their lives by going through a traumatic experience. Mm-hmm. I don't remember the reason why he started it, and I feel like it kind of delves into that later in the movies when his wife comes back. Is it about his wife? Yeah, so his wife worked... I could be wrong about this, but my recollection of it was that his wife worked in something similar to, like, a methadone clinic, and there was a patient that she was friendly with, and one night she was closing and she was pregnant. And he came back, and they were having a conversation through the door, and she was like, you know that I can't let you in, blah, blah, blah. And then he pushed 
the door open to break in to steal stuff right. and it hit her stomach and she miscarried. I think it became about him teaching people in these sort of moral conundrums, like, you made the wrong choice and now you have to pay for it. Yeah. It's interesting that we both have like, I wonder if they like ever discussed like James Wan and Lee Winnell. I'm assuming that this was a collaborative effort. If they have a story. They, did. they, they were like two separate rooms. They're just going to make this film. <laughs> I know we talked about this last week on House of a Thousand Corpses. They shot this movie for 18 days. It's very interesting. The way that they shot this film is that they never rehearsed any of the scenes beforehand. Mm. And so the first time they would like act out the scene was on film. So they didn't waste time. So some of the scenes, I don't know any of like the ones in the first one, but some of the scenes are just like the first takes because they were just like, get it done and let's go. I feel like when you're too acting like you're in this heightened sort of situation. You can only do that amount of emotion and energy so many times before it becomes... Monotonous and almost Mm -hmm. like refined. Yeah. And that's the same as like just crying in like a a movie scene. Like Bryce Dallas Howard, there's one interview she does with those autocorrect... Yes. Or autofill ones where she teaches people how to cry. And it's all just about raising your soft palate and then automatically your tears... Well, and some people have different ways of doing it Mm -hmm. because if you are trying to get yourself to an emotional place, like I, I can't remember who it is that said this. There was an actress who said that she would go back to her trailer and play sad music. (laughs) This is a terrible thing, but think about her children dying. I remember growing up, our drama teachers, like in our private lessons would always say a good actor doesn't need to think of sad things to cry because it's, it's not when you're acting, it's not about What's happening for you, really? Yes. It's about what the character is experiencing. Mm-hmm. She always would be like, you don't have to think of puppies dying in order to cry. You don't have to trigger yourself. I think that that is true and not. There is, for some people, you do have to have the foundation of, a th- mm-hmm. of something that's going to upset you to get yourself to that point before you can kind of get into the lane of what mm-hmm. you're acting. I've always wanted to watch a documentary on acting in a scary movie. Mm-hmm. Should we make one? Sure. Intrigues me to, like, I want to see, like, the process of, like, the adrenaline you must be feeling and how to just, like, kind of... Like, if you're screaming and running, how do you just, like, cut and then be like, all right, wrap? I think it's so person-dependent. Yeah. Because some people probably can do that. Yeah, oh, yeah. I think there's definitely been... Oh, my God. I wish I had specifics. But I'm remembering that there was an actor, and I think that he was talking about Daniel Day-Lewis... Daniel Day-Lewis is, like, a notorious um, method actor who has Mm. to, like, go do the thing that he's supposed to do and, like, live as that person. And whoever it was, this actor that was talking was like, no, it's acting. I go in and I do the job and then I go home. Mm -hmm. I don't need to do that. You know what? You do not have to take your work home with you, nor do you have to let it encompass your whole life. So there was this trial that ended up happening a couple years later, 2009, that was called... The Jigsaw Trial. Do you want to hear about it? I do. I'm very intrigued by this. So there was this man. His name was Jeffrey Howe, and he'd at some point been a chef, and he became a kitchen salesman. He was described as a jovial, charming character who had a heart of gold. Can you define jovial? Um, Jovial is like like a happy, jolly fellow. But neighbors got to a point where they were saying that they'd not seen him or his two Jaguars, cars. Okay, rude. For, right, for about six months, and they thought that he rented out his flat, because this was overseas. Stephen Marshall was a 38-year-old bodybuilder, personal trainer, and a former bouncer. He was a work associate and a lodger of Jeffrey, so he lived with him after Jeffrey, who was said to be his quote-unquote drinking buddy, offered to help, help him out. So he stayed there without paying rent with his girlfriend, Sarah. They stole his food, and they refused to leave after they promised to do so. They fraudulently claimed housing benefits by forging his signature and said that he was leasing the property to them. On the night of March 8th in 2009, Stephen murdered Jeffrey before, quote unquote, cleanly and skillfully dismembering him, which a pathologist said would have taken at least 12 hours. After the murder, Stephen and his girlfriend used Jeffrey's bank account to buy a laptop, shoes, food, a whole bunch of shit. They set up an account with an online retailer. They wrote forged checks to clear his accounts. They sold his belongings. And then a friend came and confronted them at the house and they said, well, he packed up and left. Then his brother came and they told him the same thing. What ends up happening is, okay, so they kill him on March 8th. March 22nd, 
a left leg with a foot attached is found on the side of a highway and a murder investigation begins. On March 29th, a left forearm dismembered at the elbow and wrist is found in a patch of grass. March 31st, a head is unearthed by a farmer in a cattle pen. The flesh had been removed as well as the eyes, the ears, the tongue, and the neck. On April 7th, a leg was found in a ditch by a driver. On April 11th, a torso, right arm, and upper left arm are discovered in a suitcase in a ditch by a walker. His hands have never been found, though they are said to be buried in a forest. The trial became known as the Jigsaw Man, and Stephen eventually admitted that he'd actually dismembered four more bodies between 1995 and 1998 when he worked for a crime family as a doorman in a London nightclub, but he refused to ever give details about the other victims. The girlfriend was given a sentence of three years, and he was given a lifetime sentence. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Also, how do you casually, you're driving down the road and you're like, oh, there's an arm. Right? How do you just spot that? And also, how do you recover? Because it's like, it's not something that happened to you. Yeah. But it did. Yeah, you were the one who found that and had to probably wait around until cops came you're guarding witness. this arm. Yeah, you're like, no one, everyone stop, this is an yeah. arm. Yeah. Please stop. This is an open crime scene. Do not go towards the arm I found. Like throw your sweater over it. <laughs> <laughs> a little grocery bag you have. Um. Also, the other one of like the person like finding the torso in a like suitcase suitcase in the ditch. What prompted you to go look what's in that suitcase? I'm not clear though because I think there's been a number of cases where people find mysterious suitcases and You're they right. call but they didn't open it. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if they actually opened it or not. In my mind, he opened it. I don't think I'd be f- fucking opening a loose suitcase no. anywhere. Where we live, if I saw a suitcase on the side of the road, on like driving home, leave it. Have you ever heard the story about my suitcase? No. What? <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. I get a call on a Sunday morning. During COVID. This was in the summer. Oh, recently? Yes. I answer the phone and someone goes, hey, this is so-and-so calling from the Holiday Inn. You left your suitcase. And I say, I wasn't at a Holiday Inn. And they're like oh, well, your suitcase is here. And I said, no, you must have the wrong number. I've not been anywhere. They read me the information on the tag. It's my information. And I'm like, what the fuck? And I would hang up out of pure fear. Well, then I remember. What? That my car had broken down and I had my car towed to my mechanic and it had been sitting in the lot overnight and my suitcase was in it and they smashed the windows. But... They rolled it to the Holiday Inn and then left it outside the door. So the Holiday Inn just thought someone who stayed there had left it. They touched nothing. That's so bizarre. Because it was a suitcase that I'd had from when I moved. And I had just put a couple, like some spare clothes and a couple of things mm-hmm. in there. Nothing was gone out of it. Was anything else in your car gone? No. You know what? I absolutely hate that. Yes. Because when I was living in my old apartment. Yeah. I think 13 of the vehicles in the underground parkade were broken into. Oh my God. Mine was one of them. Ugh. So my passenger side window, something weird happened where they figured out, I think they were trying to do it on all the vehicles and mine was the last one that they did because mine was the very far back corner one. They broke the piece that holds the window up. Like... Oh, so it just fell down. It just fell down. Mm. Everybody else's windows were broken. I thought mine was broken just because there was glass around my window, but I think it must have just came from whatever they had or on their body. Right. But my car was rummaged through. Nothing was taken. Like, why? Why? That happened to me all the time when I worked downtown. And I'm just like, what? Like, you could have cleaned. It's also <laughs> such a, you could have, one, cleaned up my car. You didn't have to th- leave everywhere on the floor. Yeah. Two, the idea of someone being in your personal space that you do not know is such a frightening thing. Because I sat in my car, I got in, I didn't notice that the window was down. And then I looked and like the passenger side compartment was open and everything was on the floor. In my mind, I was like, oh, I must have rummaged through it and didn't clean it up. And then I, like, looked in the back and, like, there was, like, my, like, stuff on the thing. And then I realized the window's open and I was like, Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I worked downtown, I never left anything in my car, but my glove compartment and my console were just full of just, like, random bullshit that you mm-hmm. collect over the years. Yeah. Like, random cords that don't work anymore and, like, mm-hmm. a CD here and there. And you have, there. like, a fork and some napkin. Yeah, and... just random stuff that's of no value to anyone. But a number of times, either, like, I didn't leave my car. I left my car unlocked or whatever. No, nothing was ever taken. But they would just tear everything apart and leave it all out. And then you would get in your car and your brain does that thing for a second where you're like, did I do that? Yeah. And you're like, oh. Why would, yeah. And then you're sitting there and it just feels like such a violation. Yeah. Because you're just, it's your car and your stuff and somebody's touched it. And it's just, it's not a good feeling. I know. And especially when it's like, 
And it's not that I want things to be stolen, but it's like, what was At least it would have been worth something. I know. Yes. No, and when I got the call being like, yeah, they smashed the window, blah, blah, blah. They were like, oh, and don't worry because they just threw the clothes outside the car. And I was like, I don't have any clothes. But in my head, I was like, okay, maybe I left clothes in my car. Mm -hmm. And then I got there and it was like a really nice leather jacket and a couple of things that were not mine. Mm -hmm. They must have gone through someone else's car or something. And they just left it all in the lot. That's what I don't understand. So you go through all this work to not take anything. Mm -hmm. The weirdest thing is so one of the other cars that was in the lot that was with mine, it was like kind of in the middle. So what they're assuming is that it was a bunch of young adults who were doing this, like probably youth. The One of the middle cars, all of the seats were laid back and there was garbage left over and like cups in the car. Ugh, so like they, they were just hanging out, out in the ew, cars. That's such a gross feeling. And so like the fact that I was like, were they just hanging out in my car? I'm like, that is so bizarre. Mm-hmm. But apparently there was like a bunch of other... Um, car break-ins that weekend how did we get here i don't know we just every time ride one interesting these are just kind of short i don't really have a lot to elaborate on them but they're just interesting about the movie the film was originally supposed to be filmed through the perspective of security cameras and elevators which would have been weird but also do you remember the movie devil that came out yes it probably would have been similar to that even Mm -hmm. though i didn't really like that movie but the concept of that was very interesting but then also James Wan had an idea, a couple ideas for the movie before they settled on the final product. One idea for the movie is that they wanted to make it about astral projection. So strange. But the second one was about a guy who wakes up in the middle of the night and notices that he has scratches on himself and that something is weird. Um, so he puts a video camera on him while he sleeps. That sounds good. Those are some fun facts. All of the butt blood was pig's blood. Ugh. You know. I don't um, know. Because the budget was tight and having, they just went to the butcher shop and asked for the leftovers. When she's digging through, Amanda is digging through for the key, it's all through pigs. <sighs> Which be makes sense because. As an actor. I know, but it makes sense because they're the most biologically, not by, bio, well. I know what you're saying. One question for you. Oh, sure. Do you have any in the first movie, any of the deaths that you were like, this was a good trap or this was my favorite trap? I actually really like the one that kills. The detective. I was going to say the same thing. The, yeah. like, four shotguns. That one? The wire. Oh. I was going to say, I like the shotguns one. It's just so unexpected. The bear trap one, I think, is also so iconic. Yeah. It's kind of like the face of Saw. It is. I just remembered something. What? And I didn't talk about it yet. This movie has scenes where John Kramer, or supposedly John Kramer, could be Zep, who was working for him, is collecting people to get into the games, but he's wearing... A rubber pig mask. And he's wearing this long cloak. Those two scenes in this movie are so terrifying to me. Mm-hmm. Like, re-watching them, I was like, I don't want to watch this scene. Dr. Gordon is cheating on his wife. and Classic yeah, doctor. Classic white man. <laughs> <laughs> um, he is going to use a payphone in this very dingy basement. Yeah, It's like a car park thing a parkade if you will (laughs) zep john kramer whoever slinks out of the back of his vehicle and like crawls on all fours around the car and i it is so creepy it's frightening and i was just like watching it i was like this needs to wrap up like this scene every time i watch like those two scenes well the first one and the second one adam taking his polaroid camera and using the flash like a flashlight around his apartment terrifying Mm -hmm. the pig mask jumps out and attacks him i skipped that scene this time i couldn't do it also laying in bed about to go to bed after and watching that i was like i don't want to think about that exactly terrifying that is just one last thing that i had to add in do you want to write it yes scary this is gonna be so this whole scale is gonna be hard because i know the first time i saw it it was tens across the board Mm -hmm. i think the concept of it of putting yourself in that situation is like a 10 yeah awful the actual, like, scare factor of being scared watching it, I I was going to say six. Oh. Just because of those two pigs really bumped it up for me. Mm-hmm. Unsettling. I put seven for gore factor. I was going to say five or six, yeah. Um, I think I really upped my ratings, but I still do just love this movie. It's okay. Yeah. It's great. Story. Seven, uh, six. I'm going to go with a seven. Like I said, first three, strong. 
and then the story dwindles off after. But the first one alone... There was a lot more moving parts to the first one than I remembered. Yeah. yeah. Well, you mentioned the wife and the daughter. You're like, where do they come Fully from? Fully forgot that was even a thing. Well, I also forgot that, like, the cops were way more involved. Yes. Because when you picture this movie, you really picture it just... The bathroom. Two dudes <laughs> chilling five feet apart. Two bros in a hot tub five feet apart because they're not gay. Yeah. You know? It's very much that... It really only takes up, like, 20 minutes of the movie. 30 minutes? I it's so. not as big as you think it is. No. Anyways. Is it a paper cut? Or is it a bloody massacre? A vat of pig blood. Ugh. It's not a bloody massacre for me. No, it's not a bloody massacre. It is one too many bear traps. Who yeah. has that many bear traps laying around? Where do you buy a bear trap? They feel very illegal to me. I know. I probably get them on Amazon. Cabela's? I don't know. I feel like maybe in specific places, but even like bear spray is really hard to come by because people use it as mace. Well, one, if you ever want to buy... No, we're not even going to talk about that. Well, that's been another episode of The Bloody Podcastacre. I'm Zach Walters. I'm Kennedy Kathleen. If you would like, follow us at Podcastacre on TikTok, Instagram, or Twitter. You can like, subscribe, and comment on our YouTube, The Bloody Podcastacre. Leave a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. Until next time. Live or die, make your choice.